Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's exciting discussion about this critical topic. So I think we all know that understanding how data drives knowledge is an important goal. And through this open data citation corpus, this is now possible like never before, thanks to a really wonderful, not just technical effort, but collaborative effort as well. And so we'll be talking quite a bit through today's discussion about how collaboration makes this possible and creating opportunities for people to get involved. So um, my name is Christy Holmes. I'm here at Northwestern University in Chicago, and it's my uh, sincere pleasure to moderate today's event. We want to encourage lots of open discussions, so please put your questions in the question and answer tool. We'll try to get as to as many of these as possible during the discussion, and we'll answer any remaining questions uh, during the event and post event. So um, without further ado, we have an exciting agenda for you today, um, which will feature brief presentations um, from speakers, uh, project partners noted on the top, um, some comments from panelists uh, noted in the community section in the middle, and then we'll move on to our discussion phase. Uh, so our first presenter is Christine Ferguson, uh, who is the Open Research Specialist at the Wellcome Trust. Christine joined Wellcome's open research team very recently and brings to the table 16 years of contributing to open research as an editor of the open access pub publishers, PLOS and eLife, working toward open data at Emble EBI, open scholarly communications at ASAP Bio, at ASAP Bio and Force 11 on desk research for open scholarship consulting projects. And then finally, also as a consultant grants manager at Arcadia Fund on their open access program. Christine holds a PhD in cellular biology from the University of Cape Town. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to Christine. Thank you. Right, can everyone see my screen now and hear me? <laughs> Great, okay. Um, all right, so um, the first port of call. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about project motivation, just stepping back a bit. And um, I'd say the first port of call for researchers or funders to um, understand the outcome of a piece of research has been to consult academic articles, right? Um, and there's a huge diversity of these and many tools available to support this. So there are commercial and open source tools like Europe PubMed Central that tell you who has written what, when, and um, who has cited and used it. But this is not giving a complete picture of what's going on in research, right? Nor who's doing it. So what about all the other types of research? As you know, um, there's um, these are independent of the finished research articles, such as data, software, and materials, and more. And um, these outputs may have been produced and maintained by people who are not listed on grants or on publications. So at Welcome, well, we really wanted to be involved in starting an open system, a one-stop shop that enables a holistic view on data usage. Uh, right. So um, our current situation is that um, Make Data Count and associated infrastructures have been built to report on and display aggregated research data usage and citations. Now, these work at a small scale, right? Um, but publishers have failed to integrate the data citations into their publishing processes, limiting utility on the one hand. And we know there are large quantities of research data out there held within disparate systems. So um, this is the problem. There are all these disparate systems and um, they can't be accessed in a one-stop shop by the global community. So uh, for example, um, data accession numbers like those used at NCBI and Emble EBI databases are completely separate from existing data citation workflows. So, oops. Um, so we have problems like limited utility, um, uh, the absence of standardized data metrics contributes to the lack um, of credit, for data outputs. Um, this hampers efforts to improve research culture and um, implement open research practices, and it restricts the evidence um, to, that, that downstream service users, funders like Welcome, they have of the impact and reach of research data. So what's the solution? And um, we want to be involved in the solution. Uh, so this is why we had welcome a funding and open system that enables a one-stop shop view on data usage 
And importantly, we want to point the research community to this holistic system that works, right? Um, so we know that DataSide will work closely with stakeholders like Open Citation to ensure the efforts are complementary. Um, and the ambition is for this corpus of information, the central corpus to extend globally and cover all research domains, not just biomedical sciences. So with that, I'll hand over to um, Matt. Uh, yeah. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Christine, for that uh, great discussion about the project motivation. We're next moving to um, a discussion about the plans for the data citation corpus. And um, glad to see uh, Matt Bies on the call. Matt is the executive director of DataCite, where he leads a passionate and committed team who provide the means to create, find, cite, connect, and use research globally. Matt's work is focused on building DataCite as a sustainable global community through efforts that support and advance community-driven practices. So Matt, take it away. Great, thanks very much, Christy. And I think um, everyone should be able to see my screen. Um, if you can just let me know if you can't. Um, with that, so yeah, as Christy mentioned, um, I'll be jumping into the data citation corpus and showing a bit about our plans. And you'll hear a bit more from um, some other partners and panelists on the um, webinar today, a bit about how we all work together. But obviously this is a community-wide initiative and lots of work going to be happening over the coming months um, where we'll be working together. But first and foremost, I think to start with, um, I, I guess the, the key challenge that we face as a community and um, Christine, you know, touched on some of this, but really what we are looking at is if we look at data site today and we look at the data citations that we know um, within the metadata that we have, very little is coming through from publisher metadata at this stage. And so a lot of that is from data site repositories, recording relational metadata and tracking those links. But we also know that there are um, other uh, stakeholders in the ecosystem, and I will talk about them in, in a moment, but other stakeholders that have um, citation information and have the ability to contribute this to a, a central data citation corpus. And so fundamentally, the corpus is looking to address the major issue that known data citations exist in third party systems, but also that data citations are not compiled into a comprehensive, publicly accessible corpus that the community can use and benefit from. Data citation infrastructure, as we all know, um, should never be manual and it should be simple. We are looking to affect culture change across the community and really work together in making sure that we can reuse and, and track uh, data reuse more easily. As I mentioned, it takes a village. And so we've been working with a number of stakeholders leading up to uh, this official launch. Um, and I've put a few on, on the screen here. Um, but really talking to these stakeholders about how we can use the corpus, how we can design the corpus for the future. And it's really important that this corpus is embedded as part of the ecosystem that we all uh, work around. And, and I guess I don't want to try position it as at the center. It's, it's one part of the ecosystem, but it's really important that there's this collaborative effort that we're all working together. We definitely foresee the opportunity um, for stakeholders such as industry um, to support uh, community efforts that have had, and we've had positive signals in this regard, talking to some of these stakeholders in looking at how we can scale up and build out um, the citation, the, the corpus, the information that we have in the data citation corpus. Over the next couple of months, our focus is going to be developing the prototype, and I'll talk a bit about next steps um, in, in, in the next moment, but also looking for this to be a demonstrator for the future. How we'll be populating the corpus, um, I touched on this, but uh, the, the corpus will be populated through two 
key categories um, of sources. So first we have third party sources, and these are sources that aggregate or discover citation through various techniques. Um, so such as vortex mining, machine learning algorithms, and you'll hear from Anna from CZI Science in a moment about their machine learning algorithm and how this comes together. But we'll also be complementing this with data sources, and these are sources that collect citations as part of their deposit workflow, uh, such as persistent identifier authorities, and so um, examples being data sites or anything from a repository or Crossref if a publisher puts in citation metadata that will feed through Envil EBI and bringing these together into one consolidated corpus. Um, also important to note that initially the corpus will focus both on DOIs and accession numbers. It's really important that we take a more comprehensive approach um, and we will look to work with the community and scale out the corpus as we go. The corpus data will be available um, through two key um, mechanisms. One, there will be a dashboard. This will be a user interface that allows the community to view and understand the data citations. Um, address some very, um, I guess, more straightforward use cases, but also noting here that there's an ability for um, uh, systems and, and stakeholders in the community to build on the corpus, and that's the second piece, the corpus data that is made available via data dumps and or APIs um, and made available as CC0 that they can go and enhance and, and answer very specific use cases in, in different contexts. Um, we know that by doing this, um, we'll be able to provide a trusted central aggregate um, of this information. And then uh, very briefly touching on our focus and working together um, over um, the next couple of months, so this is in the immediate term, um, we are focusing on building and launching this prototype, um, working closely with stakeholders, so not just the ones that I sh showed on the screen, but, but everyone around here today that wants to be involved. Um, please, in the meantime, share your user stories. Um, you can scan the QR code now or um, fill in um, from the link in the chat. Um, please follow Make Data Count and Data Sites. Um, on Twitter and Mastodon and reach out to info data site if you have any questions. We really want to work closely with you all and looking forward to a conversation following um, the initial presentations here today. So thank you very much. And I will hand over back to you, Christy. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, Matt. And thanks for outlining some ways that people can pay attention and get involved. I'm looking forward to that. Um, it's now my pleasure to welcome Ana Maria to, um, to present. She is a senior research scientist at Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, where she works on be building machine learning models in support of the program teams in the science initiative. Her work lies at the intersection of natural language processing, knowledge graphs, and machine learning applications to the scientific domain, in particular biomedicine. She has worked on a number of projects in support of open science, including developing algorithms to extract research outputs such as data sets and biodata resources from scientific journal articles. In general, she's excited about using technology and machine learning for science. Ana Maria holds a BS in Applied Math and a Master's in Computer Science and AI from Stanford. So with that, please, Ana, uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you so much, Christy. Uh, and hi, everyone. Really excited to share with you today about how the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is contributing to the Open Global Data Citation Corpus. So uh, first of all, to ground us a little bit, uh, at CZI Science, our mission is supporting the science and technology that will make it possible to cure, prevent, and manage all diseases by the end of the century. Our open science vision in support of this North Star is the universal and immediate sh open sharing of all scientific knowledge processes and outputs. We want to identify and democratize emerging and valuable methods, tools, and data sets, and bring them to a broad and diverse set of scientists uh, so that they can come to meaningful conclusions faster. One way in which we support this goal is through the creation and sharing of data sets on key research resources. And we have a number of projects we've engaged in this area so far, 
such as a current collaboration with the Global Biodata Coalition to surface uh, biodata resources from full text papers in order to build the global biodata resource inventory. And we have also recently released the CZ Software Mentions dataset, which is one of the largest data set of software mentions from the biomedical literature in order to look at the impact of software, in particular open source on science. And uh, is why we are extremely excited to be joining uh, forces with DataSite on this project to increase discoverability of data sets. So uh, what are some current challenges in data set discoverability? Uh, data aggregators such as DataSite or Wikidata have made it uh, very easy to discover data sets uh, and surface uh, paper data links. However, they still don't have comprehensive coverage. So many specific repositories are not included and also not all data sets will have an associated DOI, uh, in particular in the biomedical sciences. Uh, however, the majority of data sets in whatever format they might be mentioned or acknowledged in, um, they, they, they will appear in the full text of papers even though they're not formally cited. Uh, which means that as long as we have access to the full text of a paper, uh, we can go straight to the source and extract these data sets and then feed, uh, feed them back into uh, the, feed these uh, links back into data aggregators such as data site. And uh, this is exactly the approach we took at CZI as part of this project. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge that uh, defining what constitutes a data set is actually uh, quite challenging. So it can go very broad or very narrow when thinking what constitutes as data. Uh, we came up with our own definition at CZI, and we recognize that it might be different than others, and uh, you know we're open to, to working through it. Um, datasets can be mentioned through an accession number ID uh, associated with a database, such as GEO or BioProject, uh, DOIs associated with a repository, such as uh, Dryad, Zenodo, or Figshare, or resources uh, hosted on external URLs, such as academic institutions or organizations. And for the scope we've done at CZI so far, we have focused only on data sets mentioned uh, through accession number IDs and DOIs. And we have some examples here on this slide. Uh, first, we have a paper that mentions that uh, the data they use came from uh, two entries in the geo repository and uh, they identified the specific accession numbers. Uh, in the second example, we have a paper that, that mentions that the data associated with a study has been deposited under a DOI in the Mendeley database. And in both cases, what we really want is extract uh, these data set mentions and create these links between uh, the papers that mention them and, uh, and uh, the data sets. So how are we doing this? Um, we built a machine learning model that learns to extract data set mentions from text. For uh, data set uh, accession number IDs, uh, the model is built on state-of-the-art natural language processing methods. In particular, it is a cyber-based named entity recognition model. We have a slightly different model for extracting data set DOIs. Once we have our trained model, we apply it on our corpora. And uh, so far, we have applied it on the CZI full text corpus, which is a collection of full text papers we have access to at CZI through publishers' agreements. And we are also planning on applying it to the European C open access full text corpus. Uh, once we apply, or when we apply the machine learning model to the full text of a paper, what we get really is a string that points to a data set mentioned. So at this point, uh, the string is not linked to any specific repository. Uh, right now, we are working on a linking algorithm to link the extracted data set mentions to repositories, and in particular, linking them through identifiers.org. So um, our contribution uh, to this effort is twofold. First, we are contributing with a seed data file that contains data set paper links extracted with the machine learning models that we have uh, developed from our and uh, ran on our corpora. And uh, here's where we are augmenting the data available in data site with these new paper data links that uh, have not uh, been surfaced before. Secondly, we are contributing with algorithms. So we will be open sourcing all of the machine learning models as well as the trained models that we develop so that others can use them. Um, thank you so much. This is all I had. Uh, please get in touch with us if you'd like to learn more about CCI Science, our open science program, or uh, any of the other work that we do. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the questions and discussion. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you for making this available openly. I know there are a number of people who are attending who are excited to hear about these 
uh, these opportunities to uh, get engaged and uh, learn more about the work you're doing. Um, so now um, I'm excited to move on to the next section of our event. We've noted um, several times now that the community plays a critical role in ensuring the success and usability of this work. I'm pleased to welcome our panelists to share a brief introduction of themselves and their perspective on how the data citation corpus will support their community. So first, um, I will ask Melissa to, uh, to share a few words. Hi there, thank you for inviting me along today. So um, it's it's great to be here and also mentioned EB, um, Ember EBI has been mentioned a few times already and Europe PMC and also eLife, my other former uh, place of work. So it's um, the, the past 10 years I was at eLife and I spent a lot of time working on data citations from the publisher perspective, working on XML citation formats. And it was really interesting coming and swapping to the other side and seeing that despite all of that effort that we put in um, at eLife, we had the resources to do that, a lot of data citation is not happening properly within a publishing systems. So um, here at Europe PMC, we have a text and data mining um, pipeline that is using kind of, uh, it uh, has pattern matching for accession numbers for over 45 databases. And all of that, um, so there are millions of um, accession numbers available grounded. Um, so that's a new technology term I've learned recently, but basically linked to um, the databases that they're mined from, from the, the literature. So we're um, linked with Elixir, um, uh, as well as um, the 40 odd databases at Ember ABI as well. So we're really excited to be able to contribute that data set that we have, but also to be working um, with, um, for instance, CZI, looking at um, how the machine learning aspect of that could be advancing what we already do. So um, the key thing I think from my community is um, the, um, the DOIs are not the only PIDs for um, for data. So um, you know, DOIs are very important. And from a publisher perspective, they're really a lot easier to, to use when it comes to um, citation, but actually there's millions and millions of accession numbers from my community that we're really looking forward to having surfaced and available through uh, the data site corpus. Thanks. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for those comments. Um, so next, um, Paolo, um, would you mind going? Not at all. Thank you all for inviting me. As I, as I told Matt many times, this is very exciting. It's um, a great initiative. So I'm Paolo Mangi, I'm a computer scientist. I've actually collaborated with Melissa also with uh, all the, these guys involved in this uh, quest uh, to, to make open science a reality. And uh, as part of Open Air, I'm the CEO of Open Air. Uh, we are building, as many of you know, this knowledge graph, which is a sort of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, CRIS system, global CRIS system, where we are trying to connect hundreds of projects to uh, results of science, like publications, data, and software. And uh, we are, of course, collecting from all sources that we believe to be trusted, including data side, including uh, European C um, links, links between publications, data, publications, and software. So many links, we are collecting them directly from the metadata. Many others, we are inferring them. In collaboration with publishers, we are full text mining the papers, trying to find links towards the UI, succession numbers, and so on. And here we have a lot of collaborations with Melissa, with the Open Citation Silvio here, uh, trying to build this graph that includes all possible citations. We believe that uh, what we are trying to do here is, uh, I think, a big step ahead, because uh, unlike other scenarios, like the one we're building in, uh, in Open Air, we have Skull Explorer, which is a subset of links between a data set uh, and publications. Um, we are going to identify exactly which are the counter verifiable links. This is actually the most important aspect of this activity because many of the links that we have, we're collecting them from metadata records. So they are being declared by authors, but there's no counter verification uh, that this is indeed the reality that we can really find a link in there in the paper. So building this uh, collection, I think, is crucial. And as Matt mentioned, it's very important that all of us, all the initiatives that are mining for this full text uh, can contribute to build a unique collection where all these links uh, 
uh, are stored and openly and made openly accessible. Of course, we're willing to share our methods, our algorithms, as we're trying to do with Melissa already on both sides, where it goes down to inferring links towards accession numbers, and uh, uh, of course, also with uh, with Silvio. So really excited to be on board and um, let's get started. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Silvio to the virtual podium to share his perspective. Hello, thank you for inviting me. I'm Silvio Peroni, Associate Professor at the Department of Classical Philology and Italian Studies at the University of Bologna and also director together with David Shatton of Open Citations. As you may know, Open Citation is an independent open science infrastructure organization, which is entirely dedicated to uh, publishing open bibliographic and citation data. Indeed, in the past years, uh, we have released a series of open citation indexes that gather citation data from several sources. And recently, very recently, actually, the last December, we released one of these new indexes that is named DOCI, that is the Open Citation Index of Citations from Data Site, uh, that currently contains almost 170 million citation links from Data Site DOI to other DOI identified research outcomes. Um, indeed, the creation of future updates of this index have been possible by downloading data site citation data through their related data site ABI and therefore having such a new corpus with data citations available uh, as proper dumps basically will be crucial for us as a community as infrastructure to streamline the process of making regular updates to this index docky that we have just released and furthermore I will say that it will also allow us to have a better coverage and more new data from data sites as a source and to put all of them in context in, of this giant open citation graph that we are building, mashing up citation links coming from different sources. Indeed, uh, the data citation corpus is per se an added value to the open size ecosystem that we used to work in and it will be, it will serve for sure several stakeholders, including us, but as you have already seen others that have been involved in this journey, uh, to reach the goal of having better and better open science infrastructure available for all that links together research outcomes coming from different sources and in principle also research outcomes that do not have necessarily a DOI associated, which is one of the uh, most important goals we are trying to reach. So thank you for inviting me in this and hoping that it will be to draw to work with all of you in reaching this goal. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Cameron, um, i really delighted that you're able to join us today and look forward to hearing your perspectives. Take it away. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. So I'm Cameron Allen. And just to show how exciting it is to be on this webinar, um, I'm in on Wadjuk Noongar lands, I'm in Perth, Western Australia, where it is 11.30 and I'm still awake. So, so that's just how exciting this is. Uh, great to see so many old friends, some of them in new jobs. Uh, it seems somehow we're still doing the same things and tackling the same problems. Um, so I'm along with Lucy Montgomery, co-lead of the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative, and we talk about what we do as trying to change the stories that universities tell about themselves, put open knowledge at the heart of that narrative. What that means in practice is we're really trying to put the information that's become available through the work that many of the other speakers have been doing, all of that really fabulous data on open practice into the hands of decision makers and in ways that are actionable, but also compelling and informs that they're, they're used to making. And what we've found in the sort of conventional research publication space, these open data sources with the advent of things like Europe PubMed Central, Open Citations, Open Air, Open Alex, these now outperform the commercial competitors. End of. They're better, they're more complete, and the, the metadata is very rapidly outstripping. But when it comes to the different kinds of outputs, um, and it's not just 
data sets or data. It's also unusual things like creative practice, research objects, and other things that are harder to track, harder to connect, harder to link up. We have a, a harder story to tell because the data hasn't been complete. We haven't been able to gather it all together in one place and to be able to compare disciplines to each other, to be able to normalise, to be able to, to make sense of it at scale. Um, and that's what's really exciting uh, about this project, the idea of bringing these different approaches to gathering all of this information about these data sources together in a way that makes it straightforward to create actionable information that will elevate these other kinds of research outputs to the same kind of level as the conventional publications um, that, in fact, a really good job is being done on now. And that, to me, is, is the really exciting point, is that we have the opportunity to get to the point where, as was the intention right from the beginning of the very first Making Data Count project, which I was loosely involved with, was that 12 years ago now? Um, back when I was at PLOS, um, to move from that process of being able to track some of what's going on to being able to say, no, we can track all of what's going on and you really ought to be paying attention because these outputs matter and they matter to how we diversify and make our research practice more inclusive, more relevant and more engaged with everything that's going on. Okay. okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, uh, um... Can, uh, and, uh, I think, can you please, there we go. Okay, thank you so much. I cannot think of a better sentiment to start our discussion period on. So thank you very much for those comments. Um, I will go ahead and start with um, some questions that we received through the, um, the notepad uh, that was made available before the event. Um, and this question is open for all of our attendees or all of our presenters today which is we've talked a lot about this being a very collaborative and community oriented project and i'm wondering if you can share with us why is this if for effort different than other community initiatives um how is it that this kind of um, project is going to help all of us all of these different uh, groups work together and and do something really wonderful together um, so maybe if it's all right I might um, first ask Christine to step in on that, and then um, we can go from there. Hi, thanks, Christy. Um, I think what's different here is um, is being able to point researchers to the the, the central data, the central corpus that we're making for data. So um, right now. Um, the conventional paper databases or scientific article databases are where it's all at. And this, this will mean that we can point, we, we must quickly move to point the research community to a central corpus of data that actually works and allows people to garner citations and usage because usage is what drives, you know, um, further initiatives and further funding, really. So we really do need to do that right now. <laughs> as soon as possible that's really wonderful and others what you know what is it about this effort of everyone coming together that's a bit different paulo mm, yes i just wanted to add uh, well probably repeat a little what i said before i think there are places uh, open air open citations where you can find all such citations open air is heavily used uh, also by in Elsevier and Scopus and this kind of stuff for the linking between data and papers. But there is a but. Um, there is no clear consensus on, first of all, on what we mean by data sets and what we mean by trusted links, which is you know, the flavor that this initiative is putting on the table. It's basically trying to simplify things, right? And simplifying is always a much more complex than compl complicating things, right? <laughs> So maybe we are going to the bones and we're saying, what can we really sure about? And it's a citation from a paper to something that is not a paper. So it's something outside, which we define research data, right? So we are not coming down to conclusions that are too specific for a specific community and very hard to make across disciplines. We are taking data as anything else that is not papers. 
And we are finding those links, which again are trusted because we can find them straight in the full text, like in the old times where we were building citation indexes. This is, I think, an important step because anything else that we can find that is a link between different objects can be, uh, uh, let's say, uh, an outlier of this, uh, of this uh, collection that we are building. And we can start thinking on how to make it trusted and so on. But the initial set is crucial and I think this is really the other value, we, which we are missing today in the mess out there, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you. Cameron. It might be stating the, the obvious, but I thought it's probably worth a little story. If, you, if those of you can remember back 10 or 15 years, there's lots of really interesting innovation happening in the, in the Stockholm space from a technical perspective, and almost all of it was being done with PubMed Central or Europe PubMed Central, and it was great. But it was really, really, really difficult to make those tools move beyond the biomedical literature. Um, and something happened when Crossref got to a scale where it really had the coverage, and then you know, Open Alex and Open Air really brought that degree of coverage, which, which made those tools now easily transferable across the literature. And it led to a real explosion in possibilities. We're right at that point with data citations. We've got some stuff over here, some stuff over there. Um, people doing some really interesting things, but they just don't have the, the coverage. And so what this bringing this together, having something that's got a set in a sense global, um, I don't use the word with care, uh, coverage, international at least, multidisciplinary, um, just sets us up for that same radical change, which Again, I suspect most of us have kind of forgotten how big that shift was from the days when it was really hard to bring those data sets together, really hard to talk about publishing beyond biomedical literature. And, and now it's easy. Um, and if we can do that for data, the possibilities are, are amazing. Okay, wonderful. And Melissa, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, sure. So, um, so Cameron kind of beat me to like what I was going to mention, but I was going to mention it in a different perspective because obviously I am in biomedical. Like I always have been from a publishing perspective and to this side, but I, I was going to mention the fact that Crossref is ubiquitous in workflows now within publishers. So having managed um, operations and production side of things, it's natural that all of the workflows within um, the publisher systems, they're cross-checking their references using the, the Crossref um, API and verifying all kind of journal article references. Now I started looking at the possibility of using that the same for data side, <laughs> for, for DOIs, um, uh, for um, data, uh, e -life. Now, I think like we've talked about that the kind of tipping point and it wasn't there yet, but this I think is going to be amazing if we can have all the data citations or all the kind of data in one place, then you can push towards um, the publisher's systems having that impetus for using that to verify and cross check and it helps push um, just push it all towards that, that stage where um, references, um, so data is properly referenced, there's a proper mechanism for doing it. And, you know, like I, I said earlier, DOIs are not the only pits, and that, that is part of persistent identifiers. And so from our point of view in biomedical, that's that makes it difficult, the fact that you'll potentially have to go to loads of different databases or one other place for accession number checking and DOI somewhere else, if you have it all in one place, you're helping the systems and we're helping perpetuate fair data. Uh, that's really wonderful. Matt, and I, I'd love to hear from you on this. Yeah, and I don't want to, you know, steal the mic for too long. So I'll, I'll say, you know, I think following on from everyone's comments that this is, this is a lot about bringing together the community efforts and um, putting this together as CC0 under the POSI principles and working together to affect culture change. And there's some comments there around how are we looking to track things coming from publishers? And so, you know, if we are able to create a central aggregate corpus that the community can use for downstream use cases, we can start creating tangible real incentives for researchers to follow this practice for publishers to make sure that this ends up in the metadata, that this all feeds into the corpus and adds value to us all 
as a community, as an ecosystem. And so I think that's what's unique is for me is that we all coming around the table and obviously the proof is in the pudding. We need to go and do that work together, but it's really, you know, starting on this basis is really important. And I think that is, I think, going to be a, a really important um, aspect of, of the work that we're doing here. Great, thank you. So, I, you know, I think it's clear from everyone's enthusiasm and excitement about the work that we're poised to do together, that this is a, an important social aspect of this work. But I'm wondering, um, we rece have received a few questions from today's event about the technical aspects. And so my first question is to Ana Maria. Um, there's a question in the chat. A number of repositories store both data and non-data content. So we've got preprints, code, presentations, et cetera, uh, but use data site DOIs as standard. Can the data identification part of the machine language model distinguish what is a data set? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So it uh, kind of goes the other way around. It depends what we what we train it on, and that's what the model will identify as data. So it goes back to you know being more of a social issue, if you want, like us deciding what constitutes as data. And as I've mentioned, and I'm sure most people here are aware of, that's not always easy. And you know, even us, we have our own definition at CZI. We we've been uh, discussing with Matt at Data Site about kind of like aligning on that. So I would say first, uh, because we are using machine learning models, so the way it works, you know, you have to start with training data, and that's what your model is going to recognize and learn. So whatever it is you include in that training data, that's what the model will uh, will learn to recognize. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, and you know, here's a question, a, a broad question from the chat, which is. Um, intention. So is it important to distinguish why certain citations are made, um, the intention of that citation? Uh, Silvio. Oh, you're... Yeah, yeah I've seen it. Uh, I've seen the, the question in the chat, and it is a topic that I really care of, honestly. Also, from a research perspective, I done a bunch of researches exactly on intentions and indeed they are part of the game here it is not an easy task i mean it is a difficult task even for humans reading a pdf to understand the intention that the author had in mind basically when citing something paper or data set or whatever but i totally agree that that is a huge and important thing to address somehow something that we care about open citations we in the data model we already have space for storing intentions somehow of citations something that we will work on in the in the future but i do believe that is exactly the next step is not just collecting the links uh, that identify a site identity to a site a site identity but also to understand why that is something that can move forward even the discovery of science having using this huge graph of citation links available. So yes, I think it is very, very relevant to address somehow, not only in the this project in the in the corpus, but across all the data the, the data sets that provide citations in general. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, understanding, you know, there's this idea of the data and the role that it plays in, um, you know, in generating or driving knowledge creation, but understanding the context uh, can be incredibly important for making use of it. So it's, uh, it's a really interesting question. Um, we've talked a little bit again, you know, it's that the two, um, you know, the two hands uh, clasped together, there's the technical and the social aspect of projects like this. And one thing that I've seen called out in the chat a couple of times um, are uh, at questions that relate to the different interested parties um, that will engage with these kinds of data or create these kinds of data, um, publishers, researchers, and so on. So I'm wondering if anyone has thoughts about how to support and encourage um, good practices from publishers, um, and perhaps maybe something about data availability statements and, and those types of things. Um, Paolo. Yeah, um, 
I think uh, the, the whole problem again uh, has to do uh, with trust in general. So the first thing uh, that we are missing here is um, a way to uh, substitute or replace or uh, uh, make sure that we have a sort of uh, quality uh, trust of our data sets because the majority of them stored out there are not going through any peer review or metadata curation at all, right? So, and this is depends on the maturity of, of a community, but that is in general the problem. So I think socially speaking and culturally speaking, we should act at that level. Uh, keeping in mind that also, and this is the other issue uh, that changes completely with respect to the past, different communities have different interpretations of what resource data is, and also at different levels of granularity. Okay, so it's not easy to build a graph like the one we're building exactly because we cannot enter the specifics of every uh, and each community. Uh, where the notion of data sets changes a lot, the notion of citation changes a lot, and the purpose of citation changes a lot. Because one thing is to say, I'm citing this paper and these data sets because I need it. And one thing is instead to say, I link to these data sets because I produced it, which is completely different. And there's no alignment on how these things can be done in general. If you add on top of that, there is no curation at all. And that publishers, for example, are using the data set publishing as a way to store supplementary material into repositories. We can count uh, millions of links between articles and figures or tables today, right? Which we can only account for as resource data, which is wrong. This is not resource data at all. Although in some cases it can be, right? So I think here, uh, including publishers into the loop to clarify which are the distinction between these kind of objects or objects that are indeed relevant for science and entering the communities, asking them to somehow align on some generic concepts like we're doing here in this, uh, in this uh, setting, I think is crucial. Uh, otherwise we'd never get out of the mess. Well, that's great. Matt, we'd love to hear from you on this. Yeah, I think also just uh, noting that we're moving forward as a community and we, we still don't have all the answers on how we're using the citation information and so developing practice, what we're incentivizing, how this is going to be built into research assessment workflows. And so we need to work together on moving forwards on this. And what's really key in as we move forward is to track the provenance and try structure as much metadata around these things as possible so, so that we can describe and make, um, I, I guess, decisions about what to use in terms of the corpus data. And so that's something that's built into kind of the principles of, um, of, of what we're thinking about, you know, with the corpus. And the other piece is you mentioned about data availability statements. And I'll go out on a limb here and say that data availability statements are sometimes part of the problem because it is just data available on request. And we really, really need to move away from that. And I think there's a time and place for data availability statements, but I'll say if there is a structured data citation in the metadata, um, we can have a data availability statement. It's not either or. Um, and that's part of the challenge. And so we really want to shift as a community. And there's been some comments around what happens with publishers getting stuck to Crossref. If it's in Crossref, it will end up in the data citation corpus. Um, that's what we want. And that'll be wonderful. Um, and, you know, we're supplementing this, as Paolo's noted, with these te techniques and bringing this all together in a corpus to validate and connect these things together. Thank you. Sylvia? Yes, I will just take the, the, the consideration here about the technical perspective. Uh, as I was saying, uh, even others, we are acting as a community here. We are a plethora of different services providing kind of heterogeneous or homogeneous set of metadata describing research products in general. So uh, there is no central authority containing all the possible metadata about the research outcomes published by the whole community out there. And we are going to collaborate all together in order to, I mean, being as a whole, the, the, the central authority, the central decentralized authority, if you want, of all the data. And here it is, to me, very important that we as a community works together to define 
exchange format that allow all the plethora of different services out there to basically easily sharing data across services in order to allow a simple user to collect data coming from different sources all together with provenance information in order to understand what was the original source, who I can trust really or who I cannot trust in order to mash up all these data all to in order to be really used on a plethora of different scenarios. Here, the topic is we need to agree about how to do it because in order to have one big decentralized giant service that is really helping all the communities out there, our service communities in particular. Thank you. I'm, I'm so glad that you've mentioned the word trust. I think something like that is just the essential ingredient in a project like this, because you do have so many different groups and people and perspectives coming together. But what I think um, should uh, is probably coming across in our comments today, as well as in the engagement around this wonderful project, is that it is a very open and collaborative and nurturing environment. So I will just go out there to say that if you have questions or um, ideas um, that need clarification, I know there are the mechanisms available to make sure that those um, those are brought up. So to the to the um, people who are watching this webinar, um, maybe just staying on that uh, point about um, our interested parties. So um, we think about how researchers and and organizations will be using these data. Um, there was a question that was um, submitted before the event about how do you plan to work with researchers and other stakeholders to test the utility of the corpus, and then um, will data about the, the use of the corpus be made available? So um, I'm wondering if, if someone would be able to uh, weigh in on this. I think it might be a Matt question, but... Um, yeah, I guess um, so one thing to, to mention is we are moving into a phase now of um, focused stakeholder engagements and so different stakeholder types and personas that we're going to be looking at to understand both the utility of the corpus, but also on the source side of things as a many, many folks here that actually wear sometimes both hats um, and how do we work together so that's going to be a big focus over the next four months in working through those stakeholder groups and understanding those and also the reason why we are really starting to ask for user stories because it's really important. The other piece is looking at analytics that goes into any of our um, product uh, development journeys at data side is that we do go through a fairly robust process of validating, tracking and analyzing anything that we release and looking at those um, analytics of the corpus and um, using that as, as insights. Um, I need to look, I, I won't answer kind of the question, uh, you know, in principle, we don't have, don't have any issue with sharing any analytics, but I need to understand how we're structuring analytics. And, you know, obviously we, we want to make sure from a privacy point of view, we're doing everything that's right. But uh, generally that that would be possible. We would have it anonymized anyway and uh, on our end. So um, it should be possible. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I wanna leave time at the end for any comments that you have, Matt. Um, do we have time for another question or shall we? Um, shall I pass the virtual microphone to you? Um, I think if you've got another question, it would be great. I mean, part of this is we want to hear from the panelists. And um, yeah, so it is, if you've got another question, I think, uh, go ahead. Okay. Chris. Yes, um, I do have another question. So um, one of the questions that came in to the group before the event was how can the research community contribute to the corpus? And what are the benefits of doing so? So I, I would love to hear from the panelists about ways to um, encourage good practices that help to support the work that the corpus um, is aiming for. Cameron. I'll give this, give this a go. I think one of the lessons we've learned over the last 15, 20, 30 odd years is that all of this needs to be tackled from multiple angles. Um, I've seen Jeffrey's question right at the top of the Q&A about are we ready to, to push forward? And of course we are. 
Um, and Jeffrey knows that because he's been pushing forward on this for longer than longer than many of us. Um, so I think it's everyone needs to be thinking about not just what they're putting in, but how it's moving through and how they're then using it. Um, so you know, when you're a researcher, then obviously sharing your data, putting it in a place in a proper repository with good identifiers, um, knowing that you're referring to that correctly. But then when you're the editor, putting that pressure on, on authors or the referee, um, you know, thinking about ourselves in all of the different roles we take so that those actions reinforce themselves. Um, it's been challenging because we've been in these disciplinary silos for these kinds of data for, for quite some time. With this general corpus, the, the ability for that spread again, you know, so I would just say, think of all of the roles you take on, think of all the things that touch data, um, and not just the best practice in just your narrow role when you're a researcher, but as a, an editor, an evaluator, an administrator, a person on a funding council, and think about it in all those roles. Thank you. Thank you. I can hear an echo. Yes. Um, again, um, I think uh, Cameron is right here. Um, I was just uh, trying to say the same thing. I think publisher publishers here play a key role in the way they clarify what is a data citation and how to express it in a way that is easy, easily graspable from a full text perspective or an AI perspective, but also uh, can be represented as part of the metadata, okay? Um, and this makes the citation reliable because it can be counter verified. The, the, the problem is when we remove the focus um, uh, towards citations to data sets from objects that are not publication, so that are not textual, that cannot be counter verified. So basically the only trusted bit would be the metadata including the links citing the data set. For example, I don't know, uh, a research software uh, whose quality has been proven by using a specific data set because it's the benchmark, right? In this case, the only place where you can place the citation is the software, the research software metadata record, uh, whose you know, level of trustworthiness <laughs> is to be evaluated. This is actually a step that we cannot jump in at the moment, I think. We should actually uh, focus on uh, the kind of activity we're doing here to build this uh, simplest uh, scenario and setting and to build it in a way that is trusted, um, involving publishers and so on. The next step will be the step. So what it means to evaluate, endorse, uh, peer review uh, objects and data sets or software that are not publications, that cannot be counter verified again. But the statement is in the metadata. So metadata should be frozen, should have a DOI somehow. That's not easy. Um, and that's the next step, second level of complexity. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This is has been a, an amazing conversation. I think it is, um, it's a bright day indeed. I think we've got some really exciting work to do together as a community. And I'm especially grateful um, and excited about so many wonderful partners stepping up to be part of the magic. So thank you um, to our panelists and our presenters today. Um, nothing is possible alone, and I think this is a really great indication of how interested everyone is in this topic and, and how important it is to do it now. Uh, finally, we're able to do this, so um, it's very exciting. Um, I do want to point out that a number of the questions that have been asked during the webinar have been answered during the session, and so those are available. We'll make sure that all of these questions and answers are made um, available post-session. So um, keep those questions coming. And, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Matt for some closing comments. Yes, just to firstly thank uh, you, Christy, for moderating and also all the panelists and presenters. It's been really great to, I, I know this has been something as Cameron mentioned, we've been talking about a lot of these things for a long time and doing the same things. And I think that this is a really exciting opportunity for us all together as a community to make a really significant step and accelerate our efforts um, in this area. So um, it's really exciting for us. Please do keep track of the different um, 
communication channels. We'll be reaching out to all of you, following up with information after the webinar um, and sharing more. Um, you can expect a couple of stakeholder engagement um, activities coming up over the coming months. Um, the plan is to have the prototype up in the next four months. So um, you have an idea of timeframes and yeah, looking forward to uh, working with you all. So thank you all for joining today and um, all the feedback and questions are always helpful. So thank you all.